Well, this is a distinct honor. Uh, Gary and I have known each other, God, 15 years. And I call him up, and I didn't make the connection. We started talking. He says, Mike, this is Gary. I, oh, <laughs> Gary, we haven't talked in 10 years. So we started talking and got caught up. And he's amazing. You know, we're all, we're all junkies when it comes to learning. He uh, has been past president of the Academy of General Dentistry in the state of Tennessee. He's got a master's in the Academy of General Dentistry. And when they got done with that, everybody sat around and said, okay, now what do we do? We got a master's. That's the highest that we can go. And they turned around and said, why? So they did the program again, and they called it the Lifelong Learning Services. And he is a, a member of the American Academy of Dentistry, the International, and I didn't know there was an International Academy of Dentistry. He's an assistant clinical professor at the University of Tennessee Medical and Dental Center. He's in the master program for the general practice residency. And by the way, he does like to fish. He is from Tennessee. So um, when I found out what he was doing, I said, gosh, let's talk about a dead topic. And Gary is the expert. Gary? Now am I on? <clears throat> Gee. <clears throat> the first time I ever used a lapel microphone, much like this, all before I'd been attached to a corded mic, and I taught a lot of courses in cosmetic dentistry. Uh, Tennessee, uh, Arkansas, <clears throat> Kentucky, and uh, the Alabama AGD group asked me to go to Destin and uh, teach an all-day course in, in cosmetic dentistry. So I went to Destin. They, they treated me to a round of golf the day before my lecture. And then when I actually got there to do this full-day lecture, they put this little clip on my tie and wired me up just like this. Well, I was all gung-ho. This was so long ago that I was carrying two carousel slide projectors and 12 carousels of slides. Now, you think maybe dropping one of those carousels and scattering slides makes a mess, and that's, that's really nothing compared to the rest of the story. But uh, at the first break at 1030, I go to the bathroom. And when I came back in, there were twice as many, maybe three times as many people that are here in this room, and they all had this big grin on their faces. <laughs> and <clears throat> one of my buddies from Alabama AGD came up, patted me on the shoulder, said, next time you go to the bathroom, turn your mic off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> that got me over the number one of the top ten human fears, which is public speaking. Needles are number four. That's where we come in. People dislike dentistry because we use needles. But even being burned alive is below dentistry. So, you know, what do people think, you know? Anyway, let me get on with it. I do like to fish. I caught that little booger a few years ago and another one this year that was almost that big. That's a long-nosed gar. It was interesting to me, the front page of the brochures that Don put together for us, there's this sign there that says, don't eat the fish. And this was maybe in Pennsylvania or someplace, I don't remember. We have those at most of the boat ramps in Tennessee on the lakes that I fish. And ours say, don't eat more than two pounds of fish from this lake per, per month. Two pounds per month. But I won't eat any. I catch a lot of them, but it's just, fishing to me is cheaper than uh, having a full-time psychiatrist. So I just fish a lot. Anyway, uh, that's the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, which is an hour from my house. And then uh, the place where I fish is on the lakes is just an hour the other way. So I'm the founder of Springwater Dental Institute. I'm an international consultant speaker. I've been a dentist for 41 years and counting. I'm the co-author of two books. In fact, that's how Dawn found me and invited me to come here was reading one of the books. Obviously, I'm a fisherman, and I'm a fan of everything healthy, especially good food and good fun. So this has been my patient pool 
for a few years. Uh, that's every state east of the Mississippi, every state that touches it on the west, and a few others uh, a little further west. But now also, uh, in the last year, Europe, South America, Africa, and last week, I had a dentist fly over from Sydney, Australia, and spend Thursday and Friday with me. And uh, by the end of Friday, after I finished, I'd set up cases to show him so he could see extractions and cavitation surgery because he wanted to, be, <clears throat> to learn what I was doing. And uh, in the midst of that visit, he's like, well, why don't you take the Panorex of me? So I did. And he said, what do you think? And I said, well, I think you got two cavitations, both on the lower. So at the end of Friday, after two full days, I set him in the chair and taught him how to do cavitation surgery by putting a mirror in his hand and having him watch his. Uh, put two stitches in him, got him up the next morning and took him to my Sunday school men's church breakfast at 9 o'clock, and he was fine, pain-free, hadn't taken any medication, and he got on a plane and flew back to Sydney, Australia Saturday afternoon. Saturday afternoon. And, uh, and I got in my car and went to the lake. <laughs> uh, so my goal in life lately, I, th I thought about retiring a couple of years ago, and I decided I'd be bored. So I decided I'd just no open a new office, call it a, a dental institute, and try to hire some young dentists and train them for a couple of years to do what I do and then kick them out of my state and send them back to the world. But I would welcome any of you that would like to come Spend some time with me even for a day or two days or a week or later when I get this new office open, open next summer. If you have a son or a daughter that's graduated from dental school next year, I'd love to talk to them because uh, there won't be enough of me to go around and I'm sure a lot of you are busy too. So this is what the lake that I fish a lot in East Tennessee will look like by next weekend. So pretty place for you to come visit. The gar fishing is just, you know, July and August, so you got to plan your trips in the summer. Anyway, my goal here today is just to inspire you. Uh, this whole couple of days has been inspirational for me, but I'm going. <clears throat> I want to inspire you to see some new truths in dentistry and healthcare. So, are you ready for more? A warning. Truth is not always easy to accept. As author Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, said, all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Next, it's violently opposed. And finally, it's accepted as self-evident. Um, and as Dr. Weston Price explained, a new truth comes only to an open, prepared mind. So I'm as passionate about this root canal and cavitation issue as, as our speaker yesterday is about mercury. Uh, the government's involved in this too. So as dentists, we may not have been trained to see some of these truths. It took me 10 years out of dental school to, to have a clue. Some of the truths we'll talk about today may bring about feelings of shock, irritation, frustration, disbelief, but hopefully at the end, gratitude. First, let's talk about the Hippocratic Oath. I don't know about those of you, but I did have to... Uh, say out loud and swear to the Hippocratic Oath when I graduated from the University of Tennessee in Memphis. So what does this mean to us as dentists? We know that it means do no harm, but to me it means more than that. It means I will proactively help my patients in wellness. If, like me, you choose to proactively help your patients, you may want to consider dental care as it relates to whole body care. And I know we in this group uh, do that, so I feel like I'm preaching to the choir but that's okay. Oral health is overall health. There's Orlando Montero the Phil De Silva, past president of the FDI World Federation, said, the mouth is not separate from the body. Viewing oral health as separate from general health is obsolete. The dental, the dental profession must adapt a more interprofessional approach in relation with other healthcare professionals. And that's been covered by some other speakers, too. We need a more of a liaison with the physicians and the hospitals. I have personally gone to the hospital uh, where I work part-time and tried to get them to consider doing a 
panoramic and dental exam for every patient that's admitted with a stroke, heart attack, or cancer. And I've been turned away. They always want to know what it's going to cost. I don't like it. What's it going to save? You know. So it's frustrating. So whole health dental care is the most effective. Dr. Huggins, the father of modern modern dental health movement, says that patients cannot expect optimal results without what Dr. Huggins called complete revision. That means healing periodontal disease, replacing amalgam properly, extracting all endodontically treated teeth, surgically treating osteonecrosis or NECOs, and exercise of following a healthy diet. The results can be absolutely dramatic, but you can't skip steps. This is one patient that I treated. You can see the dates there from 2007. It took about two and a half years to see this much improvement in this lady. She was being treated by her MD for rosacea. Antibiotics, 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 getting, getting no place. So I used thermal scans sometimes, but it did point out that she had an infection on the lower left of her jaw. Uh, I like good digital panoramic x-rays, but I'll take all the information I can get to help diagnose. So here's part of her panoramic x-ray. What's right there? Root tip. What's around a root tip embedded in a jaw? Osteonecrosis. So I laid a flap, got the root tip out, and that was probably the worst thing she had going on systemically. Uh, and cleaned up her periodo, periodo disease and, and a few little amalgams, and she got a lot better very quickly. So now that you know a little more, what can you see in the next slide? So what do you see here? Can you see well enough to see another root tip right there? Okay. They're not that uncommon. That's what I call, just do it right the first time. No, it doesn't often get done. So next, let's see how dental problems affect bones and whole body health. So some of the next x-rays of skulls are from the bone library. So let me take a, just a minute to explain what the bone library is. Uh, a lot of people know about the body farm, and uh, I think it became at least famous in the U.S. when... Uh, Sandra Bullock made a comment about it in The Blind Side, the movie. But the Bone Library was started by Dr. Bass probably 25 years ago. And what he set up as a Ph.D. anthropologist was a way for people to donate their remains to the University of Tennessee. Well, that Bone Library is in the south end of the Tennessee football stadium, and most people don't know it's there or that Probably that end of the stadium would be half empty and they'd only sell 80,000 tickets instead of 100. But it's there and it's a room about three times the size of this one with stacks and stacks and stacks of boxes. I have looked at over a thousand skeletons, mostly complete with, with skulls and some of them complete with uh, medical history, meaning we knew the cause of death in, in these uh, donated bones, and it, it, it's become an honor, kind of an honorary thing to to donate your bones to the University of Tennessee. So I'm signing up, and I've had several patients do that in the last couple of years. So it, it's just something that's near and dear to me because of the educational value that it provides for our graduate students, and even more than that, for people like uh, myself and and the new anthropologist, Dr. Murray Marks, and I. Uh, have been doing this bone research since Dr. Bass retired to write novels. So we have looked at 1,167 boxes of bones. It is a library. You can check out bones just like you can check out a book from a library, uh, except that you have to have a research protocol and a good reason to do it. The catch-22 has been they will only let us check out Five, and we don't want the whole, the whole box. We only want the skull. They will only let us check out five skulls at a time. And we can keep them for a week and turn them back in, and then we can go back and check out five more. <clears throat> so we have now 
checked out five skulls from the bone library and looked at them, photographed them, and created a way to set the skulls on a, on a camera tripod and reset my Panorex di uh, diameters and, and get a decent Panorex of a skull with no flesh on it. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, as of right now, we have yet to be able to finish all of this and publish a paper, but that's the goal to have that done by next year. It, take, it has taken three years so far. So, <clears throat> the connection then between, this is the part you have to know, the connection between the, quote, the body farm and the bone library, the bone library pre-existed the body farm. The body farm was a three-year exercise of taking donated bodies in the flesh that came into the hospital, putting them out behind the hospital in the woods or a field under various conditions of different clothing, <clears throat> different depths of burial, uh, all kinds of variables that, that uh, Dr. Bass could think of, just to try to timeline when we found this person, how long have they been laying dead in the woods? That was what they were trying to do for the FBI nationally, the TBI in Tennessee, other police forces, that was this, the goal of this. <clears throat> well, I'm glad this is after lunch, and I'm glad I don't have any of Dr. Bass's slides to show you, because you'd never eat rice again. It came down to, we can timeline date, the, how long a body has been lying dead uh, by the fly maggots in their eyes. You can date the the development of these maggots that set up housekeeping on dead bodies. Pretty interesting if it doesn't gross you out. So anyway, it, it came down to the whole research project after three years and, and multiple bodies and, and multiple ways of uh, burying people, either you know, three feet deep or an inch deep, or just throwing them out there. <clears throat> it came down to, more than anything, the air temperature. The hotter it was, the faster they decomposed. Uh, if it throw them out in the winter and it's, and it's freezing for a week like it does in Tennessee, they don't st start decomposing at all until they thaw. So temperature became the variable, but it really helped police agencies to, uh, to be able to timeline these things. Really interesting stuff. Anyway, what I wanted to see in, in these skulls, and this is not from the bone library, this is from one of my patients, but I want you to tell me what you can see here and then we're going to have some more skulls to look at. Anybody? What's our routine? Cavitations where? 17 and 32. I agree. No root canals, no other issues. But what I like pointing out is that if you can see the outline of a tooth in the lower jaw and the patient tells you that tooth was removed over a year ago, I'm pretty sure right now that there's a cavitation there 100% of the time. Not always that easy to see and not as easy to see on the maxilla as, as these are. One of the things I look for now is just this little black triangle. If you see that, there's a cavitation there every time. So just learn to, learn to see that bit of uh, lack of bone density. So we only see what we know. This is what I'm here to do is try to help you see more. And now you can see all of that. So this is from the bone library. What do you see here? Cavitation right here. Anything else? Well, this is a metal pin that the morticians use to tie the jaws together, but you're talking about here? Nope. Right there? Okay. Probably this is a cavitation that's been squashed because of lack of all those molar teeth. But I, yeah, I think that's probably unhealed here, definitely there. This one? Thirty-two. I have to point out that some of these, uh, once the skulls dry out and in the, bone library, in the bone library, the teeth just fall out in the box, a lot of them. So that's not it extractions that's just missing teeth and they get lost Murray and I super glue them back in when we tie them <laughs> okay this one golly this one's more difficult to see but 
Another root tip. One more. What's what's different over here? Piece of mercury. Yeah. Uh, bone doesn't heal real well when you break a chunk of amalgam off and leave it in the jaw either. What else do you see here? Thirty-two cavitation. What else? One more. What's that? It's a root canal on a, on a lower bicuspid. Crown's broken off, but it's a root canal. Sorry, those are not as easy to see on the screen as they are on on my computer. Another one? Is it? Cavitation 32. I think one more. Whoa! <laughs> The upper arch is pretty clean, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, my guess, uh, <laughs> my guess, uh, well, you know, kept falling off the tripod. And, you know, we're using modeling clay and all sorts of things. And finally, you just say, let's just do the lower jaw. So that's probably an ameloblastoma, but short of having an actual, you know, pathological diagnosis, we don't know, but that's what it appears to be. So, uh, Okay, this is where things to me get even more interesting than the x-rays. What we see on our radiographs are the density loss in bones. And you probably could see this defect and you probably could see that. But what strikes me so much on these, and there's periodontal disease dissolved involved in both these two, but what strikes me on both of these is you start looking at all of the diseased bone in a much wider area than right at what the defect is you see. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so let's explore 12 truths. The first seven are dental related truths. So There's follows. Truth number one. Teeth are alive. There's fluid flow from the pulp all the way through the dentin and enamel into the mouth. So one of my favorite statements to patients, <clears throat> telling a patient that you can take a nerve out of this tooth, do a root canal, it won't hurt anymore and everything will be okay is a ball face lie. Because what you have right here is not just nerve, it's blood and nerve, artery, vein, and nerve. And if you can measure blood pressure in someone's arm, what do you think that is right there? That is blood under pressure. There are no capillaries in dentin. There are what are called dentin tubules. So blood plasma, the clear stuff when you get a blister, that's what's keeping the dentin alive. So dentin is a very cork-like matrix that supports enamel, which is in interlocking, almost glass-like prisms that are also held together by staying wet. Now, I can debate whether that wetness comes from inside out or from outside in, but I would contend that a lot of it comes outside, I mean, from inside out. And that's generally why this whole if you do a root canal this whole system is going to dry out and get brittle and break so let's waste a thousand dollars on a root canal waste another thousand dollars on a crown because that's what the patients are doing so dentin tubules uh, they're great when you have those supplied with fluid from blood, blood pressure but they turn into the Hilton of bacteria hotels when you lose the blood supply. Number two, dental decay affects the entire body. As the Journal of International College of Dentists states, tooth decay is not just a local problem and certainly not trivial. Rather, it is a systemic disease which involves all parts of the body. 
Truth three, infections are serious health problems, specifically three types of dental infections, focal, anaerobic, and tonsils. You may not consider tonsils dental, but I do. It's something you have to look at. Three weeks in a row now, I have examined women with a history of breast cancer and could not find a root canal or a cavitation, but all three of them had infected tonsils, one side or both. I'm talking frank, swollen, red, blatant clumps of anaerobic bacteria in their tonsils. And they, these women are in their 40s and 50s. Got to get the tonsils out. So the focal theory of infection, when germs infect one part of the body and then move to another area, this process is called focal infection. The focal infection theory is almost completely accepted today by physicians, dentists, and other health professionals. My favorite sentence from Weston Price from 1925, no type of focal infection lesion of the entire body is comparable in danger to an infected tooth for the defenses of the body cannot enter the tooth and annihilate the source of toxic bacterial irritation. So what's going on? No blood supply. Your own white blood cells can't get there. Antibiotics can't get there. Nothing's going to help except rem removing uh, an abscess tooth, whether it's root canal treated or not. The tooth has to come out. Anaerobic infections are infections which cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. They can infect deep wounds, deep tissues, and internal organs. The toxic waste byproducts of anaerobic bacteria are more dangerous than the bacteria themselves since they cause inflammation. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what some of these anaerobic waste products look like when we look at some cavitation surgery slides. So, inflammation leads to systemic disease. I actually learned this morning that there can be a crossbreed of these. There can be half and halves. I didn't know that till today. Glad I came down here. The infected tonsils are often overlooked. Infected tonsils are inflamed, red with yellow pus, may cause flu-like symptoms including fatigue, pain, and weight loss. Infected tonsils account for approximately 3% of breast cancer victims. Astoundingly, the research is that the other 97% of breast cancer patients all have a root canal. There's your 100%. I wonder where that 3% went for a while. It's tonsils. Number four, periodontal disease uh, can be easy, easily avoided. It's called pyorrhea, but 80% of the general population has it. It's the most common anaerobic infection and dental disease. It can also be deadly. deadly. So where's all the printed research been since 96 to 98 that links dental disease to uh, systemic illness. It's all been about pyorrhea. It's all been about periodontal disease. I haven't seen much of any other of these infections talked about in, in any of the dental journals I read. So we've all seen all of this, but here you go. If there was a skull when I looked at the skulls in the bone library that shocked me, this one probably got me the most. Because this is a periodontal infection, but it goes all the way from mental foramen to mental foramen and to the bottom of the mandible. So if you only remember one thing that I'm going to tell you today, I want you to remember this. Whatever you see on an x-ray, it's worse it's worse on the inside. Dr. Sam Lowe, president of the American Academy of Periodontology, said in 2010, periodontal disease is a bigger problem than we thought. Given what we know about the relationship between gum disease and other diseases, taking care of your oral health isn't just about a pretty smile. It has bigger implications for overall health and is therefore a more significant public health problem. And this has been in the published press, most of it. I, I cut out an article out. It was in USA Today, I think, in 98. So the results of periodontal disease. Heart attacks been documented. Strokes documented. Low birth weight babies, babies documented. And cancer will be if I get my research published. I know it's true already. So how can we 
help patients avoid avoid periodontal disease, basically teach them home care. I could spend the rest of an hour talking about this one thing, but I won't. I'll just make a couple of points. Home care doesn't have a damn thing to do with toothpaste. <laughs> My patients ask me what the best thing there is to brush their teeth with, and I said, your own spit. That's why God put it there. Don't I need toothpaste? No. And then we get into this abrasion thing. I mean, people brush by habit. They brush by what they see from selling toothpaste on TV, but they'll take a big load of toothpaste, put it at the... At the uh, gingival junction of the tooth and and just saw away well all that does is give them abrasion which was when i was in in dental school was called toothbrush abrasion i've renamed it it's toothpaste abrasion that's where the abrasive is so so they're like so what do you want me to brush my teeth with and i said i want you to just wet it and go just use your own spit and i said then if you've really, really, really got to uh, take, have that good, taste good, fresh feeling, said so then brush your tongue with toothpaste. Said so your tongue will grow back, your teeth won't. <laughs> so people are, are such creatures of habit. If you get a patient to come into your office, and we're going to call this healthy, below this line, various levels of bleeding maybe three bleeding points here, 15 down here. Patient comes in, uh, you educate them, your hygienist does all the plaque control. And if you can get these patients to return on a regular basis, hopefully you can keep them fairly healthy. Human nature is if they don't come back for a year, they'll be right back where they started from. And we've all had patients do that. They disappear for a year or two or three or four and they come back, and not only is their gum disease back where it was, they've got five or six more decayed teeth. Truth number five, root canals are not in your client's long-range best interest. Is that the understatement of the day? So how sick is this person? They're pretty sick. Um, and uh, again... I see this on an x-ray now, and I know it's probably you know, way bigger when I look at the bone reaction to, to something this bad. Now, another thing that strikes me on, on this particular panoramic is how do you tell if there's an upper wisdom tooth area cavitation? And this is your best clue. That sinus right there, there's most likely a cavitation here and it's being fed by the infection from these two root canals but there you could take these two teeth out but you've also the simple way is take the teeth out and pop pop through there with with a burr if you need to and a curette and clean that area out also because when you see a real live patient and you see that you pretty well got to and particularly if you see a patient that doesn't have root canals in that area but just that and this, they've probably got a cavitation on the upper arch. Those are really simple to treat compared to the lowers. So this sinus looks fairly normal. That one doesn't. So walk that little tip away in your memory bank. Oh, root canals. Root canal is the only procedure in any field of medicine for one, where one can keep a body part with no blood supply. I'm going to have that sentence chiseled on my tombstone. Um, and I hope the buzzards come and sit on it. Uh, root canals are worse than mercury or cavitations. Root canals precipitate many anaerobic infections, even cancer. Current holistic dental recommendations are that endodontically treated teeth should be removed before age 50. And that is immune system dependent. And I will explain that in a minute. Root canals are an archaic treatment that should be eliminated except for the temporary relief of pain. Tooth removal and modern, modern dental implants are safe, effective treatments at about the same cost. Even removable partial dentures are a healthier option. There's just no healthy way to keep a dead body part. 
Now, this came from the Bone Library, but what interested me was Weston Price talked about two different reactions to root canals. One, you get uh, bone sclerosis, which you see here, and the other reaction, you, you get uh, granulation tissue, which we see more often. But if you took an x-ray of this tooth with this fracture of this root off plane on the x-ray, you'd never see it. You can't see everything. But radiographs are just a help. But the more I looked at these skulls in the bone library, the more I said, boy, that, you know, these x-rays I'm taking, they're, they're just the cover on the book. <laughs> so, uh, this particular tooth I took out had a root canal. This one didn't, but it was going down the tubes. So one of my contentions is you put crowns on these teeth, you suffocate that fluid flow from the pulp through the dentin and out through the enamel. So I keep being concerned about this. I, I try uh, as much as I can to leave as much enamel exposed when I do have to, to put a crown on a tooth. So this is the granulation tissue reaction. Root canals and illness. Most people who have root canals will eventually become ill. People who have root canals and do not become ill have exceptionally good immune systems. Now, this is Weston Price's drawing from an article he did and was published in 1925. This is everything you need to understand about why, uh, why you. This helps explain why all of this is so difficult to understand, that root canals don't cause the same ailment in everybody. They do different things. And this is Weston Price's expl explanation. So this is age, and this is immune systems. Weston called this absent susceptibility, inherited susceptibility. We would call this a poor immune system. Thankfully, I'm pretty much up here. Uh, but... My patient pool tends to be, you know, largely this group and a lot of these people and occasionally these. But I, I've had 70-year-old people in the, I had a 70-year-old woman in the office, 72-year-old, about three weeks ago. She had five root canals and not a single bit of change in the bone on her, on her x-ray. So she's, she's got this immune system. She's healthy. She doesn't have any systemic illness. Her blood pressure's fine. She's not a diabetic, and she's concerned about these root canals. And I said, look, you, you're going to be worse off if I mutilate you and take five teeth out than if I just leave you alone and we monitor. So unless she has some kind of uh, disease label put on her, I, I wouldn't do anything to a person over 70 years old. They, you know... They deal with this stuff differently than these folks down here. So just keep this overall picture in mind. Um, have any of you ever been to the Smoky Mountain National Park? Been to Caves Cove? This is the tunnel that you go through to get to Caves Cove. It's, it's one of the prettiest places in the Smokies. I call it the gateway to, the gateway to Abrams Creek. <laughs> Trout fishing. So truth number six, cavitations or NICOs can be seen on x-rays and in the bones. What are cavitations? AKA NICOs, neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. Now these were described as neuralgia meaning pain-producing osteonecrosis. It's rare that I actually see one of these causing pain. Uh, Dr. McHorris from Memphis was one of my... Uh, dental school instructors when I was there. And he came to Knoxville about three years ago, did a program. He was the first person that I've ever heard talk about cavitations in, in public in Knoxville. And he asked for a show of hands in the audience of people that treated cavitations. And I raised my hand, and it was the only one in the room. And he said he'd done ten, and he'd gotten really good results out of five of them. And, and so he was treating people that actually had pain, apparently. So osteonecrosis just equals dead bone. So we've been looking at these. I think you'd be better at seeing them on, on x-rays now. See the outline of that tooth. See these over here. So 
Here's what healthy bone in the bone library looks like. Really different from what these other brown pitted pieces of bone that, we're, that I've been showing you. There's a cavitation, probably from a horizontally impacted wisdom tooth. And even though the actual bone destruction may not be much larger than the tooth was, it's still, you still see it spread from the bacterial infection. So what do you do with these? Well, lay a flap. <laughs> so this is the real deal. So many times when I lay flaps for cavitations, look, look at the character of this bone. It is nothing like good, healthy, healed bone. For something that the ADA and the insurance companies won't create a CDT code for, and to them doesn't exist or they don't want it to, that is actual gangrene coming out of a number 30 cavitation. Uh, I punctured a capsule. If you've ever seen those little black cubes that you can light on the 4th of July and you get this black worm that just grows, that's what this did. I'd never seen that before. This was probably 20 years ago now. So I'm like, geez. And then uh, that's so you can calm your nerves down. This is the other, this is the other, this is the distal root. I got the gangrene cyst out of the distal root intact without poking a hole in it. I didn't want to breathe that damn stuff either, you know? It scared me. Gee, many. But I want you to notice my. I think you can tell from this, my, my typical incision is always a triangle and the holes I make anymore are never bigger than what I can stop up with one index finger. Why is that? I was taught early on to do cavitation surgeries by removing rectangular blocks of bone and doing trapezoidal flaps. But until you've seen arterial blood squirting 18 inches out of somebody's mouth, uh, I guarantee you after you see that one time and you've got a half inch by inch hole in there that you can't stop the bleeding, you won't ever do that anymore. So it doesn't matter what size area, even, even three molars can be missing and I can do three separate triangular incisions and safely get to these cavitations and, and treat them and suture them up without any bleeding problems. Don't want that to ever happen to any of you. So I, I talked about the bacterial toxins. This is what you see floating on here. It looks like black oil. And I, I talked to uh, Dr. Boko about five years ago about this, and I love his quote. Uh, he said, you find the oil, you found the problem. So you can't see the bacteria, but you can see the waste products. I mean, I've never ever, I mean, I've fallen down, got hurt, done foolish things, and I've made myself bleed in a hundred different places, but I've never seen oil coming out of one of them. I just, it just doesn't happen. Uh, but this is typical uh, cavitation sludge, for lack of a better word. You will see the oil that looks like this. You will see fluorescent yellows and fluorescent oranges. And you will also at times see what looks to be just a metallic sheen come floating to the top. Seeing that? Uh, I can't find, can't put my hands on the paper where I read it, but someone described that as when you have wisdom teeth extracted, the body will use that empty space as a trash dump for things it doesn't have any other place to get rid of or can't get rid of. So it will store heavy, your body will store heavy metals in a, in a wisdom tooth extraction site. I've never seen it on the upper, but I see it on the lower routinely. So what, I, what do I do with this? Well, I take a small curette and just feel my way around. I have, I have, there have been multiple times that, that the mandibular nerve will be denuded and I can just move it over and scrape under it, move it back the other way and scrape under it. The artery and the nerve are all in a capsule. Certainly don't want to be poking around in there with the sharp side of the curette, use the concave side. And just, you can do that. That's rare. I don't want to scare you. I mean, you don't see that very often. Most of the time, that artery, uh, nerve and vein bundle is encapsulated in bone in the middle of the mandible, so you don't have that much to worry about. <clears throat> so you scrape and wash and scrape and wash until it comes out just 
blood with no other components. Doesn't it really take that long? Uh, and then uh, some of the things that have, heard, have gone past the day are what I do. I mean, I, I irrigate these copiously with colloidal silver. And then the last irrigation that I do was one that Dr. Huggins taught me, which is rinse with a uh, rinse with an epinephrine-free anesthetic. Which, by the way, that's an important point. I don't want to forget. Most of these it's finished before sutures. I think there are two reasons that cavitation cavitations form after extractions. Number one, too much epinephrine in the anesthetic. I do almost every one of these with plain carbocaine and zero epinephrine. It's it, once you get the tissue flat made, there's nothing inside there that hurts. It's rare from for patients to feel anything. So you're not gonna yeah, I mean you can dig around in there all you want to and they're not gonna feel a thing. It's just getting through the tissue that's uncomfortable. So too much epinephrine and failure to thoroughly clean out the periodontal ligament. Those two things are all you have to do. I personally don't think you have to take a burr and take a millimeter of bone out of a socket. Uh, but you do have to make sure that you've removed all the periodontal ligament. With a sharp curette, you can do that. You can feel the difference between what feels like tissue and bone. It's just a small learning curve. And then suture these up. And uh, at that point, I'm almost finished. And then uh, the other thing, the other thing that I do on all of these patients, and it varies between uh, out loud verbally or sometimes silently, but I pray for every one of these surgery patients. I mean, I, I will ask permission, put my hands right on the wound, and pray for their healing. And there's there's power in that, and it's it's good for me, it's good for them. Uh, going to the top of that mountain right there, that's uh, Sphinx Mountain in Cameron, Montana, 10,960 feet. I stood right there when I was 45. I put it back on my bucket list while I was doing this program. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I'm 67. I'm going to do it again. A few more examples of osteonecrosis. Commonplace. All three molars missing. Again, even denture wares, it will compress them. I was trying to show you that on the, on the Panorax of denture wares will compress these cavitations. They will look a little flatter, smaller. They don't go away. I'm more concerned about what's under it than what's over it, but I will. Uh, if you if you take away what's under there, you get a pretty good feel later. I've gone back into some of these, and that porosity will fill back in. I like to what I would say sand it with a round burr. It's just go over the top of it and try to get a little light bleeding across the top of that. But do I need to make a big hole? No. I just don't want to do that. You're opening up the disaster unless you do that last. Okay. This is the scariest piece of mandible I've seen in the entire bone library. This is, this is the mental foramen. And I saw this as purely a decayed, broken off tooth that, that uh, had a periapical bone loss but right here that's this I mean that that's I don't think I would have ever seen that on a panorex the bones the buccal lingual bones too thick it would have just totally hidden that so that's just one more example of no matter what you see on, on, a, on an x-ray it's worse on the inside sorry I skipped one so truth number seven um uh, Mercury amalgam restorations are unhealthy. No amount of mercury can be considered, considered harmless. Lead, mercury, I'm sorry, lead, arsenic, mercury, each one of those is 100 times more toxic than the one before it on the periodic table of elements. So mercury is three times more toxic than lead. And uh, I don't think I've heard anything on TV, TV, TV about getting lead out of paint. I mean, I have, I've heard about getting rid of the lead in paint, but I don't hear anything about getting rid of your mercury fillings on TV. I don't know David Kennedy. Some of you. I love it. Uh, mercury's bad. 
That's the end of the discussion on mercury. Uh, this is uh, Watts Bar Lake where I have a home. And uh, but that whole lake, as beautiful as it is, is mercury contaminated. It's, it's even worse. It's contaminated with mercury, PCBs, and uh, no telling how much stuff they can't find from Oak Ridge where they built the atomic bomb because it's upstream from here. And I catch a lot of fish, and somebody asks me at least once a month, well, did you eat that fish? Because I have pictures of them. I wouldn't eat that fish if you put a gun to my head. It, probably you could go out there in a boat at night, and you could see swish swimming around in there to glow in the dark. So I want to explore five more truths in overall health which relate to dentistry. Number eight, good nutrition is the best medicine. We've studied that all the last two days. American diets are harmful. Again, we only see what we know. What were we taught to see in this meal? This meal is less than optimally healthy. Meat has antibiotics, fertilizers, pesticides. Potatoes are GMO and sprayed with weed killer before harvesting. The veggies have synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. Dessert has nitrous oxide or some other propellant, anesthetic, and canned whipped cream. Fat, sugar, and nearly no nutritional value. And I created that to take the picture and then ate the dead gum thing. I wasn't going to waste it. <laughs> Fed some of it to the dog. Um, Dr. Price's worldwide nutrition research. Dr. Price examined primitive peoples who had almost no tooth decay, crooked or impacted teeth. All of these made many diverse tribes of 14 races lived on widely different diets. They universally maintained excellent health. They remained free of tooth decay, crooked teeth, impacted teeth, and degenerative diseases, diseases until they were introduced into civilized man's diets, including white flour and sugar. In one generation, consuming such food caused these primitive cultures to develop many of the same diseases we experience in America. Who was it? Where's Bill? What was that? Uh, oh, I was talking to one of my friends today about I've treated a whole group of Amish people that live in this corridor between Knoxville and, and uh, Minneapolis. And uh, the, the Amish people have gone through the same thing Western Price said. I mean, I see the grandparents were, were pretty healthy. The children and the grandchildren, they're having the same problems as the rest of us. They're the, all these Amish that live so simply and so healthy. Uh, they've gone down the tubes like the rest of us have. So what can we do to improve our nutrition? Eating healthy does not require a specific diet. Just do this. At least try. Eliminate man-made items, anything from industrial food manufacturers, anything wrapped or enclosed in plastic or that comes in a cardboard box, I think. Conventionally grown foods contain chemicals, fertilizers, GMOs. So choose organically grown raw foods instead. And I feel like you know, I'm sitting on the wrong side of the desk and somebody's asking me, but well, what's this going to cost? It's going to cost more. Well, yeah, it probably is, but is it worth it to us? So I'm making a bigger effort all the time to find local produce without succumbing to convenience. Final thoughts on nutrition. You can't stay healthy on Coke and Twinkies. Or as was in the, in the USA about... Uh, a month ago, it was uh, oh, Mountain Dew and potato chips from Kentucky, a whole culture up there that doesn't have the money to put gas in their car to go to a real grocery store. So they're eating out of little fast food corner markets. And, and the predominant two items, Mountain Dew and potato chips. And uh, uh, they're not wasting away. They get really gain a lot of weight on that diet. So organically raised foods provide superior nutrition. When eating a steak, select one that's smaller than a deck of cards. All the cancer survivors that I know are juicing. There is something about juicing and just mixing up your raw vegetables and drinking them that makes them easier to digest, I think. Exercise. This is kind of a senior thing. Push-ups are more important than jogging. Any of you know why that would be? Why push-ups are more important? 
I still can't hear anybody. Fall down? Yeah. Bone density? No, it's not even that. It's we seniors, people like me. I mean, the 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 worst thing that happened to us is we're out jogging, we trip and fall. You got to be able to catch yourself. So, you know, push-ups. Uh, don't bang your head. Uh, moderation in all things. And uh, I'm a real fun, real fan of starting my mornings with visiting Dr. Mercola's website. So, truth number nine: fluoride's bad. And a quote from David Kennedy. Fluoride's a danger to our bones, brain, kidney, thyroid. That's from Mercola. Systemically, fluoride's never good. Uh, what can we do regarding the use of fluoride in dentistry? Only use fluoride topically and only when absolutely necessary. Seniors with decreased salivary flow. My patient pool seems to have grown up with me, and I'm seeing more and more root surface decay than I ever have, so I'm, I'm using some topical fluorides with that. Plus the patients that I have with a history of radiation to the face or throat. But that's about the only time I'm using any topical fluorides, but you've got to do something for them. Uh, number 10, take precautions with vaccines. This has been covered ad nauseum this last couple of days. Vac vaccines contain mercury thimerosal. It's been known to increase risk for disabilities such as autism. Vaccines carry a high toxic load which is difficult for small, young bodies to bear. If you have your children vaccinated, try to wait until they reach a weight of at least 40 to 50 pounds. I think the children cope, seem to cope with that better if they just get some body weight before they go to school. Truth number 11, avoid plastic and plastics and bottled water. BPAs are DNA toxic. Try to find a spring or filter your own water. Reverse osmosis is best if you can't find your, uh, a natural source. Refill your own glass bottles. Plastic bottles and bags are an ecological nightmare. We hear that California last week totally outlawed plastic bags in grocery stores. They're gone. It needs to be bottles and bags. But, uh, number 12, beauty products are not so pretty. Someone else talked about this today. The health and beauty industry, which includes make, makeup, perfumes, lotions, shaving cream, shampoo, conditioner, deodorants, etc., is largely unregulated. Read labels. Ingredients contains glues, chemicals, toxins, and fire starting agents and fire retardants, too, in some of the bed linens. In addition to items we simply don't know and, and are often labeled natural ingredients. So warning, this, this Natural ingredients doesn't mean anything. The FDA has not developed a definition for use of the term natural or its derivatives. So again, this is beautiful East Tennessee. We'll look like that and probably looking like that now. By next week it will be. So now that you've seen these truths, what can you do? Recognize that good, healthy blood supply to teeth is essential. During all exams, check for infections, including focal, anaerobic, and tonsils. Apply and share good dental home care, nutritional and wellness information. Read labels. Take your own health seriously. Proactively care for yourself and your patients. Be a good, healthy example. So my goal has been to inspire you to see dentistry differently, see oral health and overall health as intertwined, see our Hippocratic oath, oath as an opportunity to proactively care for patients' overall health. What can you do with all this? Learn to see the hidden dangers in x-rays. Acquire additional surgical skills. Try your best to do no harm. Proactively care and Share this information with your patients and your and your peers. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Wait, wait, wait. I get the pleasure of thanking you on behalf of the IMBDM. Thank you for being one of our...
I'll talk loud. Right. Gary, oh, that's on. Thank you. I'll hold it for you. All right. I got it. I want to thank you for approaching a wonderful topic. When I heard about the uh, library, uh, I thought I saw a lot of that when I was at the University of Illinois, those bodies in the uh, cages and stuff. But they were just graduate students like okay. yourself. <laughs> so, but on behalf of the academy, thank you very much for a wonderful time. Okay, thank you. Don, you have a few announcements to make. What's the code? The code for this session is 1011GC. 1011GC. 